stay with everybody. I'll just um, moderate with voice. Um, but I did want to say that um, I'm extremely pleased uh, and honored to be chairing this last session. Um, thank you to Anna and the organizing committee for having me. Um, we will, I think because of time, uh, am I frozen again? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. If I um, have trouble, then maybe Anna could be my backup um, because again, the internet yes, connection sure. is very poor right now. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Um, a little bit overextended at the moment, <laughs> as we all are. Um, so if we could just go in the order that um, that is on the conference schedule, um, you will get to begin with um, one uh, presentation by two people. Um, and will it just be Raquel presenting? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Raquel Matos from the Universidade Católica Portuguesa, um, who will be presenting a co-authored paper called From the Decision to Migrate to the Detention Experience and Intergenerational Approach. Um, I will, because um, I don't have visual, I'll just send you a chat message uh, with a two minute warning. Yes, um, okay, great. And then we'll go right to um, uh, Ioannis uh, Papadopoulos. Um, and please pronounce your name properly if I have not done it. <laughs> um, I would appreciate it. Um, from the University of Portsmouth, who is presenting, if this ain't detention, what is it then? Um, on the case of Greece and children. And then finally, we'll have Dale Balucci and Sam Jabrai from Western University, um, just up the road from me in Toronto, uh, with a paper called A Helping Hand But Not For All, um, examining the systemic harms of guideline three. And as per practice, I will collect questions. So feel free to just pop them in the chat as they occur to you. Um, and maybe Anna and I will work together and we will collect all the questions and have a great discussion afterwards. Um, so please, Raquel, uh, take it away. I, can, can I share my presentation? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, you can. Can you see it? Can you listen yes. to me? Yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, I'm so sorry for some confusion because yesterday we told Anna that we were going to make a shared presentation, me and my colleague, Francesca, but this morning she was called for having her COVID vaccine. So, <laughs> so um, she, she can't be here. And I have to say that we, we really had a shared presentation and she had a very long second part of the presentation. So, so I'll do my best to be on time. Okay, so we, I also told Anna, we told Anna yesterday that we were going to slightly change the name of the presentation. We are working on some intergenerational topic, but um, we decided to bring to the to this uh, discussion our, our, our the work we have been doing more systematically and I can say more consistently on gender. So I will call the presentation from the decision to migrate to detention experience: gender vulnerability and resistance in, in, in resistant immigration detention. So, can you see the second slide? Yeah, is it? Okay. So, um, let me talk a, a little bit about, uh, well, Dol Francesca is Italian and she's currently working in Oxford University. She has been doing um, work uh, with me in Portugal in a, detention, um, in a detention facility. So we are going to talk about data that we have in some field work that we have been doing in Portugal. So let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the, the Portuguese uh, immigration 
information detention system. I have to say that uh, um, this is um, a hot topic at the moment and I'll try to explain in the beginning of my presentation why. So we have in Portugal five short-term facilities for um, migrants detention at the airports, at the main airports in the country. And we have one, I will say small, if we can say that a small um, in terms of size, not in terms of meaning, a detention center in the city of Porto, in the center of the city of Porto, with capacity for 30 adults and six children. And um, just to give you a brief notion, detention in Portugal, well, according to the European rules, can be up to 60 days and exceptionally for 90 days. So until 2020, so just one year ago, the detention of immigrants was barely included in the Portuguese public debate. So we have just this small units um, in Porto, and it follows a management model that was designed to be, and is always presented as an example of human rights and human dignity, if we can say so, when we talk about migrants detention. So for for these reasons, the, the Portuguese immigration detention system has never been truly questioned or debated in the country, even though it has been criticized in several external um, reports um, I, I, I bring to show you uh, the example of the global detention report with some numbers and uh, with some critics about the Portuguese system. Um, and there tends to be some, um, one of the, 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 um, the, the things that is more criticized is uh, the, the conditions for children, for the detention of children. Um, the Portuguese Immigration Control Services finally came to the center of the public debates when Ior Omeniuk, a 40 years old Ukrainian citizen, was found dead in Lisbon Airport Detention Facility in March 2020. So we had the coronavirus and we had this um, shocking news. He had a tourist visa, visa, visa sorry, to come to, to enter Portugal, but the border inspectors or officers insisted that he was coming for work so they wanted him to show a work visa. And for that, that reason, he was sent to the airport detention facility after refusing to board a flight out of Portugal. As you can read in several news, as this one from the New York Times, days later, he died of asphyxiation in the detention facility after border, border inspectors handcuffed and beat him. So just recently, these border inspectors were sentenced to imprison, imprisonment, but not for homicide, just for aggravated, we call aggravated offenses to the physical integrity. Um, so this is um, this is an important picture, and especially because uh, I have to say that uh, the field work that we have been doing is in the detention units in the center of Porto with capacity for 30 um, people, um, but the, the, we don't have, we never had access to these airport facilities where more than 2,000, about 2,500 people are detained per, years, per year and in these small units, about 200 people per year, 20% women and a few children. So we will present, I will, we will present some of our uh, um, thoughts um, based on the interviews that we made to 10 women, seven from Brazil, two from Nigeria, and one from Sri Lanka. Most of them uh, had been living in the country in Portugal for several years. And I will talk a little bit about their migratory pathways and their experiences of crossing borders. So. Uh, uh, from these interviews and the analysis of these interviews, we we mm, there were uh, there was a diversity in these women's migratory pathways. But all ten women moved because they sought economic, social, and affective mobility. Seven women came from Brazil. One of them during childhood, but all the others later in their lives. The majority of these women. Uh, reported very poor living conditions in their home countries, experiencing economic deprivation, lack of access to education, early need to assume household tasks. And in addition, most of these women mentioned experiencing violent intimate relationships and the desire to escape from these relationships was one of their main drives to move. So in the particular case of Gloria, 
Uh, she moved driven by the desire to escape from traditional forms of gender control as she was looking for a context where she could take over her transgender condition. Gloria reported having experienced discrimination at different stages uh, in her life, as well as other forms of violence. She, she decided to come to Europe looking for respect for her identity and for the possibility of experiencing femininity permanently and safety and safely. Sorry. Um, throughout all these interviews, and I say interviews, but um, we spent some time there, especially Francesca. So, in some, so we had more than one um, uh, encounter with these women. So, throughout these moments that we interviewed these women, they provided some interesting insights regarding the gender challenges that they faced when crossing transnational borders. Uh, notably, these challenges, despite being universally faced by the women we met, were quite different in their nature due to the intersection of gender, sexuality, and sexuality with other structural determinants, namely race, social class, or nationality. For instance, coming from a sort of a privileged background and having her father regularly working in Portugal as a businessman, for Barbara, it was not difficult to get the visa to come to Portugal. But on the contrary, to other Brazilian women who came from less privileged backgrounds, on, they only managed to come to Portugal on a tourist visa with a limited uh, validity period. To do so and accomplish their desire for mobility, they had to rely on relatives, on some people they knew and that were in Portugal, but they also had to demonstrate to have enough finances to be able to support themselves during their stay in the country. Despite this evidence, however, the Brazilian women ultimately managed to fly and uh, to and enter Portugal legally, mainly due to the post-colonial relations between Portugal and Brazil, which is a topic that I will discuss later on. But for those women who came from Nigeria and Sri Lanka, of course, getting a visa was almost an impossible endeavor. So such an even distribution, as we know, of access to transnational mobility between citizens of different countries, of course, show us the geopolitical power relations at stake when we talk about this management of mobility. About life in Portugal and what we call pathways to illegalization and detention. So these women that um, uh, most of them had been in the country for some time, they told us that they had been living in the country in Portugal in a highly vulnerable situation. So the conditions they, we concluded that the conditions they tried to escape from uh, through migration somehow persisted in this new country they moved to. So they're, Narratives illustrate well the experiences of discrimination, violent relationships and labor exploitation, as well as the existential precar precariousness migrant women face in Europe and the global North more generally. They also show the role of gender in the creation and maintenance of circumstances that relegate non-nationals to a condition of illegalization. So overall, the limits to legalization were con constantly present in these migrant women's daily routines, making legality um, unreachable for many of them. So most of these women came to Portugal, as I told you, with a valid visa, but were caught in pathways that led them to detention, ultimately to detention. So when we tried to understand these pathways, two dimensions stood out. First of all, the bureaucratic obstacles for the legalization process, and on the other hand, the role of manipulative rather than supportive relationships. So they mentioned several obstacles um, in the legalization process, even when their everyday lives um, were within legal context and included interactions with citizens whose documents or legality was never questioned. So as, as Barbara, a young Brazilian woman explained, I had everything, social security, tax number, I just had no residence permit. They mentioned the efforts made to actively achieve a documented status. Uh, in particular, several actions they triggered over the years for this purpose, but those actions had ultimately proved to be unsuccessful. In Diana's words, we tried several times, but it just didn't work out. 
Impacting on these women's failures in achieving legal st status were the relationships established with significant people who were supposed to be supportive but were manipulative. For instance, uh, Barbara and Diana, and that was something uh, striking, reported having been controlled by their partners who, who took advantage of their illegalized status as a control mechanism. Diana explained that her partner, partner used her illegalized status to control her and ultimately he ended up calling the police on her after a fight and this led her to detention. Claudia spoke to us about the lawyer who took her money but didn't help her and when they identified the relationships um, that enhanced their vulnerability, gender clearly emerged as a catalyst that along with other dimensions amplify their powerlessness. So, and this was supposed to be Francesca. <laughs> So as I was saying, the majority of these of the women we met uh, um, inside the center were from were Brazilian, and this of course reflects our uh, uh, immigration, the Portuguese immigration trend. As according to our statistics, as in the latest statistics, Brazilian citizens are the largest community of foreign nationals in Portugal. Uh, about 25% and the group most affected by forced deportation operations, followed by other countries like Cape Verde, Guinea, Angola, all of them former overseas Portuguese colonies. So it's not surprising that the majority of the women we have interviewed were from Brazil. And mm -hmm. another important thing was that most of them also had experiences in the sex industry in Portugal. Several Brazilian feminist scholars have long argued that a persistent imaginary um, uh, so that associates Brazilian women with an hypersexualized and available body marks the everyday experiences of these women in Portugal. The story of the story of uh, Fran. A 49-year-old Brazilian woman who had been detained for 20 days when we met her in the center uh, illustrates these issues well. She had been detained by the police during her night work. Recalling this episode, she described an excess of authority and the feeling of having been treated like a criminal. In her interview, she complained, Portuguese don't like us Brazilians a lot. Some security guards, she believed, enjoyed seeing her suffer. Overall, Fran associated her experience in the detention, in detention with the broader discrimination suffered by Brazilian people in Portugal, which included the gender stereotype of Brazilian women seducing Portuguese men to take advantage on their financial resources. Fran was not the only woman who was arrested during a sex work and not to, not to allege this mistreatment by police. Um, Emilia, a 47 year old Brazilian woman also emphasized the disrespectful and this discrimin the discriminatory behavior adopted by state actors, including the judge who assessed um, and validated her detention. And this quote that you can see here is about this judge that she, she, she that really annoyed her, um, the, the way he deal with, uh, with her, he dealt with her. Uh, and also, she also talked about the, the, the behavior of the immigration officers um, who arrested her. Emilia also uh, connected her experience with immigration enforcement to the gendered and sexualized stereotypes affecting Brazilian women in Portugal. In putting forward this claim, Emilia challenged the disparaging vision of Brazilian women reasserting their dignity as women and workers. Yet she did so by proposing, as you can see in these quotes, a moralizing view of Portuguese women's sexual freedom. Overall, while gendered and racialized norms and expectations clearly affected everyday life, in attention, women also navigated the system by adhering and reproducing, but also reappropriating and performing hegemonic constructions of femininity and vulnerability. For example, 
when we spoke with Elena, a 21 year old, years old Brazilian woman who had been in attention for two weeks. And at the time of our encounter at the center was four months pregnant. She criticized the fact that her vulnerability was not acknowledged by center staff. During the interview, Elena explained that inside the center, she felt sick, but that the staff did not believe her complaints and refused to take her to the hospital. Angry about this situation, Elena claimed that the body was hers and that she was the only one who knew, who knew what she was actually feeling. They don't know what I'm going through. I know how it is what I am going through. In such claims, she used her identity as a pregnant woman to denounce the unfairness of the detention system, system and claim her rights, especially to health and care. I can't suffer like this, she said. Uh, it's no good for me. This is no good for the baby because I feel it and he feels it too. Overall, the medical certificate for a risky pregnancy was, according to her, the tool she could have to oppose her deportation. She could not travel in this vulnerable situation and she was concerned with uh, the Zika virus in Brazil and she, saw, she thought she could um, rely on that. For those already with children, motherhood offered another basis on which to understand and oppose detention as well to challenge the legitimacy of their deportation. This was the case of Barbara, for instance. Although she said, to she received good treatment in the center she described the experience of the tension as horrible having spent most of her life in portugal and feeling more portuguese than brazilian barbara struggled to make sense of this form of administrative confinement also complaining about the constant threats of deportation as a difficult psychological game her biggest fear was that she would separate from her three-year-old son accordingly it was on her role as a mother that barbara ultimately relied to contest the legitimacy of the detention and deportation system. She was really, she, she, she used to say, if you ask me to, to sing my national anthem, I will sing the Portuguese. I don't know the Brazilian one. So just to conclude, the accounts we, accounts, accounts we shared amplify women's experiences of intersectional oppressions and overall show how the border control system in general and the immigration detention system in particular work to maintain a racialized and gender social order in post-colonial societies. All the women, all the women, I can see the chat, two minutes, yes, I'm just finishing. Um, that, that, that all the women we met mentioned the efforts they made to actively achieve a documented status. As I told you, they described several actions that they triggered over the years for this purpose, but those actions ultimately proved to be unsuccessful, revealing the structural and systemic violence inherent to the immigration system. Furthermore, and despite their individual differences, the account presented point to the hypersexualization imaginary concerning Brazilian women in Portugal. As Adriana Piscitelli noted, the sex and marriage markets and their frequent overlapping are the main industries in which the racialized notion of sensuality associated with Brazilian femininity becomes embodied. embodied. If this is certainly true, for the women we met, such hypersexualization was also intertwined with a criminalizing rhetoric about people on the move. So overall, and to conclude, our findings reveal the significance and pervasiveness of colonial imaginaries and the gendered and racialized power relations stemming from them in the everyday experiences of women in detention, not exclusively, but especially for the Brazilian ones. Thank you very much. Oops. Great, thank you so much. Um, there goes my timer. <laughs> um, that was uh, a great way to start our final panel. Um, so Ionis, are you ready to go next? Yes, of course. Uh, can you hear me well? We can. Excellent. Great. Give me one moment to share my screen. Of course. Um, I believe you can all see my screen now. Yes. Excellent. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for staying this late. I mean, this late in Greece, I guess. Um, my name is uh, Ioannis Robadopoulos. I come from Greece. I've been practicing law for the past 10 years, specializing in migration law, human rights law, and criminology. And for the past six years or so, I've been collaborating with humanitarian organizations, uh, providing legal advice and 
practical counseling to unaccompanied children and my, vulnerable migrant populations. With uh, my specialization, specialization is with uh, migrant children and uh, separated children as well. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you a part of my PhD research. Last year, when I submitted this paper, I was still in the process of submitting my PhD. Now I'm pleased to inform you that I got my PhD recently. So it's my pleasure to inform you about a part of my PhD. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, my research was based on examining the criminalization of unaccompanied minors through detention processes in the Greek context. So with no further ado, I don't want to go through uh, the definition of unaccompanied children because we all know uh, about unaccompanied children in general. What I wanted to say initially is that I always European Council definition compared to the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees definition of unaccompanied children because the European Council specifically states that unaccompanied children are not just those children who um, enter the country alone or arrive at the borders of the host country alone, but also those children who are accompanied by someone up until that moment that they cross the borders of the host country and they're left alone right after that. Uh, in their majority, uh, unaccompanied children originate from countries that are severely affected by forced migration, warfare activities, and a clearly unstable socio-political regime. For which reason, there is a general consensus, both in literature and research, that this group is the most vulnerable of all individuals seeking safety in foreign countries. Uh, currently, in Greece, unaccompanied children could be located, according to the law, could be located either at the national borders, that is, at the islands where the reception and identification centers are located, so basically the islands close to Turkey, and one detention center in the north, right next to the borders with Turkey, or in the mainland. In the first case scenario, when children are located uh, at the reception and identification centers, meaning at that specific moment when they're located trying to cross the borders of the country, uh, it is up to the state authorities to confirm, first of all, that we're talking about unaccompanied children, meaning that they were the state authorities are expected to inform the competent public prosecutor about the existence of unaccompanied children, because according to the Greek law, the public prosecutor is the temporary guardian of unaccompanied children up until they are transferred to appropriate either long or short term accommodation structures under the responsibility of an um, NGO, for example. After that, state authorities are expected to provide adequate support, care, services, including registration procedures, including psychosocial support, legal aid, in some cases, age assessment procedures, which is pretty straightforward in a sense. But in the weird case when children somehow manage to cross the borders without being spotted and they somehow end up in the mainland, all these procedures are up to the police department to uh, figure out how to complete these procedures. And as you can see in the next couple of slides, this is not always successful uh, because, again, the police is expected without proper training to complete all the reception and identification procedures until these children are somehow placed uh, in proper accommodation facilities. Interestingly enough, uh, the law clearly states in Greece that regardless of age, Anyone trying to cross the borders illegally or even attempting or achieving to cross the borders illegally is arrested and be prosecuted and will probably be facing punishment of imprisonment of at least three months, that is three months to five years, and the penalty of at least 1.5 thousand euros, unless the individual decides to apply for international protection, meaning that the criminal case is somehow postponed until uh, there is a definitive um, rejection of the application for international protection. So step one would involve arrest and prosecution for illegal entry. Step two would involve detention with a view to deportation. And especially in the case of unaccompanied children, what we like to call protective custody, but take my word for it, it has nothing protective in it. And step three would involve deportation unless the individual decides to follow voluntary departure procedures we see in the case of an accompanied children in specific. But regular entry is supposedly uh, leading to total measures of a protective character, but in practice, this form of custody ends up to actual detention, is somehow similar to criminal detention, which raised an important question that I kept asking myself throughout my PhD research in a couple of years before that. Does this process lead to the criminalization of an accompanied children in Greece? I mean, does this form of tension somehow 
place and accompany children within the immigration debate. Uh, but let's take first things first. Uh, detention in Greece, first of all, detention for unaccompanied children is not allowed, according to the Greek Ombudsman and the High Commissioner of Refugees. This is pretty straightforward and understandable. Uh, we should also keep in mind the Geneva Convention specifically stating that asylum seekers should not be prosecuted for illegal entry. Uh, and therefore, legal penalties are to be imposed only after an application has been definitively rejected. This is where the most recent asylum law in Greece comes into play, specifically stating that only an applicant is protected from criminal prosecution. But how can you prove that you're an applicant? Therefore, the new asylum law in Greece stated that even the declaration of intention to apply for international protection will make you an applicant, which again is a matter of proof. Because if someone is arrested in the mainland and someone takes him or her to detention, if this individual at that specific moment declares the intention to apply for international protection, this person is not to be facing criminal prosecution until the end of the application for international protection, which if, if, if this case ever reaches the court, it's again a matter of proof that this individual declared the intention to apply for international protection or not. Especially in the case for uh, unaccompanied children, detention is to this day is allowed, you can see in the parentheses, the plethora of legislation on the matter. Detention is allowed to this day only as a measure of last resort, that is only for 25 days pending referral to proper accommodation. And this period can be extended by an extra 20 day period only if appropriate accommodation is not available on the 25th day. During detention, children are to be placed and kept separately from adults to be provided with appropriate activities, access to education, legal aid, social support, with their age and vulnerability be taken into consideration at all times, including the best interest of the child principle as enshrined in Article 3 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Again, no. Uh, with regard to protective custody or custody of a protective character, if you may, according to the law in Greece, a presidential decree of 2013, unaccompanied children are to be placed in special accommodation units or in any other form of suitable accommodation as soon as they are spotted on Greek ground. However, it is due to lack of adequate and appropriate accommodation for unaccompanied children at arrival that children in most cases end up in detention facilities, pre-removal centers, police stations, they are susceptible to a wide spectrum of human rights violations, including at the sharp end multiple expressions of violence. And in most cases during my PhD research, I had uh, I took interviews and conducted interviews with practitioners and children who experienced detention, unaccompanied children. And the majority of them, this is quite, quite interesting, they stated that they were indirectly prevented from submitting asylum requests during detention. They chose to lie about their real age, about their actual age, they decided to declare that they were adults because this way they wanted to be taken out of detention without knowing that deportation would be the only next logical step, which again proves a point that during detention, legal aid was never provided to these children because if they had legal support, they would know that it would be a big mistake to lie about their age and declare that they were adults. So practice was never a matter of prioritization of detention over protective custody and protect, protective custody was never an excuse over uh, detention but it is the lack of adequate and appropriate accommodation that eventually leads to detention being misinterpreted in practice as protective custody which is a big problem at the moment in Greece. Which brings me to the obvious question, are unaccompanied children considered to be part of the criminal debate? My colleague uh, Cristina Fernandez had an amazing presentation uh, about crimmigration debate. Uh, crimmigration debate remains a fairly recent and largely abstract topic. Despite of current research on the various forms of crimmigration on the legislative level, including the criminalization of illegal entry or stay, as well as issues of administrative detention and deportation on the basis of an immigrant's criminal background, what particularly struck me the most was that no question was ever raised with regard to the issue of unaccompanied children being apprehended and placed under detention in Greece as if they had committed an actual crime. Unaccompanied children in Greece have a unique status brought about by the criminalization of a social policy imperative. As detainees, as administrative detainees, they are not to be punished or experience more condemnation since they aren't convicted under the relevant criminal law provisions. Instead, due to the country's inability to provide them with proper accommodation at arrival in the country, 
um, Greece has resorted to a de facto use of criminal justice facilities and de facto criminalization of unaccompanied children. This is in direct contravention to the CRC. In reality, children are criminalized through the process of administrative detention instead of entering a de facto condition as if they had already committed a crime punishable by the criminal law. So it's not an issue of deciding whether or not unaccompanied children should be members of the society or even worthy of inclusion in the national community, as such a discussion would have been based on the premise that unaccompanied children are considered to be criminals from the moment they cross national borders regularly, but they are not. Which brings me to a theory of mine which I developed during my PhD uh, research. This is what I call the vicious circle of, of UAM detention. We have children that are, should be placed in a protective environment as a temporary accommodation uh, measure until they're placed in long or short-term accommodation units. But in practice, this sort of temporary accommodation is somehow transformed to a detention process that has no clear legal meaning. At the same time, we have the best interest of the child principle that should apply at all times. And we have Article 12 of the Convention on the Right of the Child on the right to be heard in every judicial and administrative proceeding, paragraph 2 of Article 12 which raises the obvious question, how can in children detained and accompanied children be heard? Because if detention, the way it's currently applied, is a form of judicial measure according to Article 12, then these children should be provided with the right to be heard according to Article 12. But in reality, according to the law, this detention is a vague gray zone that's not detention exactly per se detention, and it's not protective custody per se, it's somewhere in between. So no one can identify what sort of detention this is, and no one knows what kind of rights these children are entitled to. This is, this is where qualitative research comes into play. My main aim wanted to provide, was to provide minors and practitioners with the ability to be heard so that we can eventually examination of the participants' personal lived experiences within detention facilities and try to understand how participants make sense of the conditions within detention. And the only way to do that was through uh, phenomenology, IPA, interpretive phenomenological approach, by applying the double hermeneutic process in the sense of trying to understand what the participant was also trying to understand about their own life experiences. Briefly, I want to share with you some of my research findings. I don't know if I have enough time. Uh, after conducting the interviews with uh, minors and um, practitioners, I organized all the findings in different superordinate and ordinate themes. So briefly, I want to share with you information about the hygiene concerns that unaccompanied children and practitioners had as regards the conditions within detention. You can see that in the first um, example, we have a child, uh, A.H., first name, last name, 17 years old, from Pakistan, having spent 60 days in detention instead of 25 days, according to the law, applying for asylum in Greece at that time. And you can see that they were describing horrible conditions, uh, no hygiene uh, measures taken whatsoever, in the clearly unsuitable detention setting, that did not even the children with the basic information, care, support, and services, according to the letter of the law, including children that were at that moment applying for family reunification processes in other European countries. So in a sense, according to the Dublin regulation, they were not to be kept in detention, but simply to be transferred to a different European country. So you can see that detention would apply in every case scenario. Also, apart from detention setting and hygiene concerns, you can see that there was a lack of services. Uh, especially when it comes to food and water, uh, every child was provided worth with uh, 5.46 or 47 euros per day. And with this, like pocket money, if you may, children were expected to buy their breakfast, lunch, dinner, hygiene uh, items, or just name it, because nothing was offered to these children during detention facilities and during detention. Injury. And as regards abusive treatment, children repeatedly mentioned incidents of uh, abusive treatment, both physical, uh, verbal, sometimes uh, sexual um, abusive treatment by other children and by adults, because in most cases, children were not placed in 
specially designed rooms just for children, but also among adults as well. And interestingly enough, not adults that cross the borders of the country illegally, but also uh, adults who expected to be transferred to a detention facility because they had committed an actual crime. I'm particularly excited to share with you something, but I don't know if I'm excited or not. Uh, let you decide. This is brand new information. About three months ago, the Greek state, uh, Greece, announced a new law about introducing the abolishment of protective custody. This is brand new information. The law is 4670 of 2020. It was introduced in December 2020 amidst the pandemic. Uh, what is interesting about the new law bill is that the government realized, the state realized that protective custody is not working out for the past seven years. So it took us some time to realize that. And the intention of the government was to create a new law bill that would allow children to be transferred directly to appropriate accommodation uh, without having to go through detention facilities. So the obvious question was how? And this is when the state introduced the national tracing and protection mechanism for unaccompanied children in precarious conditions. This is how they call it. They introduced a tracing and protection team and tracing line that would accept referrals on a 24 hour basis. Uh, and at the same time, they introduced the establishment of 100 emergency facilities in the area of Athens, the general uh, area of Attica, Athens, and Thessaloniki, North Greece, that are expected to be fully operational by the end of May 2021. Uh, we still expect these to be fully operational, obviously that would uh, provide care support and services, including psychosocial support and interpretation services and medical aid to children that would have to be placed temporarily in these emergency facilities until they're transferred to more appropriate and long-term accommodation units. However, what is really interesting is that the new law clearly lacks clarity regarding unaccompanied children who are already in protective custody procedures because the new law did not mention those cases simply mentioned that for all those children who are now spotted entering greece they would be immediately transferred to those accommodation facilities so no one knows exactly what would happen with children who have spent more than 25 or 45 or more than two months in detention at the moment because there are not enough spaces in this sort of proper accommodation and interestingly enough there are no indicators guarantees or references whatsoever as regards legal support. So it is up to the children themselves to somehow find a legal advisor to support them throughout the asylum procedure, because the new law doesn't state anything about that. Which it uh, allows me to conclude with my presentation. Within this new law, qualitative research would again be the solution to the problem. Only by analyzing the participants' experiences through qualitative research after this new law bill is applied in practice, we will be able to re-examine the consistencies between law and practice and figure out whether or not the law is properly applied in practice and whether or not the CRC provisions are applied correctly as regards unaccompanied children, thus allowing us to put the best interest of the child into actual practice instead of keeping it as a simple de jure doctrine. Uh, I would like to thank you for the time. It will not be here today. I've heard so many interesting, insightful, and unique presentations, and I'm open to any questions you might have at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and another person keeping to time. I'm so pleased and making everybody's job easier, and um, everyone appreciates it. Um, so. Last but far from least, <laughs> it is such a pleasure to introduce Dale and Sam. Um, I'm not sure if you spoke to Anna about how you'll be presenting, but I'll let you uh, take it away. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off and then Sam's going to jump in and then I'm going to jump at the end again. So first off, I just want to thank Anna for inviting us. I had the pleasure of meeting her a few times while she was here in Canada, uh, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. Just having listened to all the presentations for the last two days, I think I speak for Sam as well when I say we found it really refreshing uh, and enlightening to be around people with like-minded ideas. The work that we're presenting today is actually coming out of um, part of my dissertation work. So I own a sign on your page. I did my dissertation in a similar area to you. And I had a very hard time finding audiences 
uh, that would be interested in this. So it's taken me a while to get some of it out. Uh, and when we returned to it, we had one paper, or we thought we did, and now we think we have three. One, we um, were originally going to put this panel, but it has now been given an R&R &R at another journal. And then we had this paper come out of our discussions, and we thought it'd be ideal to present here today. So we're very excited to get any feedback. This is totally a work in progress. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing um, your ideas. And just coming after on, it's, it's just perfect timing. Uh, and having Julia before discussing the importance of language is also going to be emphasized through our presentation. And I think what we're also going to see is the theme that Anna and Kelly were talking about in terms of the power of documentation. Uh, so I feel like, you know, even though we're at the end, it might be a, a our presentation might actually be a good way to sum some of the major ideas that have come up, but some of major ideas, because there were just so many great ideas here today so far. Anyway, now I'm going to pass this conversation off to my very competent and fantastic PhD student, Sam, who's going to begin our presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to echo Dale's sentiment and really thank Anna and the organizers for having us here today. Without you, we would not be here. That's, that's <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, Sam, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Great. All right. Uh, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Is that is that a yes? Yes, I can. Okay. See All right. So uh, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to provide some brief context and then delve into some of our methodology and motivation for the paper. Then I'm going to address some of our analysis and then finally wrap up with a discussion and then pass it back to Dale for some concluding thoughts. Sorry, Sam, I don't know if everybody can see the screens. I can, one's blank and then the other one is visible. What can people see on the other side? Yeah, it's presenter's view. Yeah, presenter's okay? view. Okay, so we're gonna change that right now. Yeah, change the view because no one can see what uh, you're trying to show them at this time. Uh-oh. How about now? Uh, I Perfect. Think that you have to go to this to the display settings and then to say to double it, this is because you have a double um computer i do i do okay so we're gonna figure it out <laughs> this is saying that it happened to me do you know so sam if you had a mac it would work easier yeah if i had a mac yeah story of my life okay so let's see no. here what about the presentation what about now and then yeah. That's good enough. We see it. That's good oh, enough. Not okay. now. Uh, go oh, to display now. settings. Uh, that's okay. I think we're okay. You can see my uh, next slide. That way you know what's coming. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, so back in 1990, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child demarcated an international shift on the discourse of children's rights. So this was one of the first international recognitions that children require distinct or special considerations separate from that of adults. So among many other countries in uh, around the world, Canada ratified the CRC and implemented many of its principles within the Canada Chairperson's Guideline Number 3 on Child Refugee Claimants. And uh, this is the subject of our analysis for our paper and our presentation. So guideline three is statutorily authorized by section 159.1 H of Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. However, whereas the IRPA is codified law, the guidelines are merely guiding principles that can be rejected with reasoned justification by adjudicators. So this rejection based off of reasoned justification actually speaks more broadly to this culture of suspicion or culture of disbelief that's perpetuated by immigration law, policy, and adjudication. Contributing factors like age, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and cultural background all impact how individuals and their credibility is perceived, but especially with regard to children. There was one study done in 2006 that uh, in the UK done by Heaven Crawley, who noted in 2005, there are 44% of all child applicants actually had their ages disputed within the hearings and were ultimately treated as adults for the remainder of the proceedings. This form of objectification of children and their credibility ultimately lead to the dehumanization of children, of some children, and through in turn uh, allows for the detention and deportation of them as well. So this is the reason why we believe it's really important to actually examine the language of guideline three to determine what types of special considerations are given to children on the very basis of their age, gender, and cultural background. And this is especially important considering the fact that guideline three is actually, to some extent, 
you know, revered worldwide. And being critical of the very thing that is revered is, is an important way of, uh, of uh, trying to address the very issues that, that are raised with the policy itself. So to do so, we employ the hermeneutics of suspicion framework. And this is a form of interpretive discourse analysis that allows for researchers to decipher expressions of written law or read between the lines of written law. And suspicion in this context is a little different than suspicion, like the culture of suspicion mentioned earlier. This just refers to the suspicion of text itself. Um, and through this form of analysis, we actually build on Francis's institutional humanism, whereby lo the law objectifies refugee children and dehumanizes some of them on the basis of their race, class, ability, gender, age, and refugee status. So before I get into our analysis, I think it's really important for an international audience to understand the context of what Guideline 3 is. It's a short two to three page document written originally in 1996 that's broken down into two sections. There's the procedural issues and then evidentiary issues. There is a preamble before these two sections uh, quoting the UNHCR's definition of children under the age of 18, as well as instructions for adjudicators to discern between an accompanied minor and an unaccompanied minor. The procedural issues section is broken down into three subsections. The general principle effectively instructs adjudicators to adhere to the best interests of the child. We're going to address this a little later in our analysis, uh, but yeah, that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, the designated representative is an interesting uh, subsection because in the IRPA, the codified law, there is a section stating that all minors under the age of 18 must have a guardian, otherwise they would be assigned a designated rep representative by the state. However, there are no instructions within the actual codified law itself that you know, provide the roles and responsibilities of a designated representative. So it's this section within the guidelines that like, elucidates the uh, yeah, duties and responsibilities of designated representatives. Finally, on, on procedural issues, there is the processing claims of unaccompanied children. And this is an important acknowledgement by the state to indicate that unaccompanied children are particularly vulnerable compared to their accompanied counterparts. And there are specific instructions on how to, how to engage with the unaccompanied minors. In the evidentiary issues sections, there's uh, two subsections, eliciting the evidence as well as assessing evidence. And again, this is just an acknowledgement of the fact that children require special considerations when providing oral testimony or documentation and adjudicators and immigrant immigration officers must be aware of how to both, both I guess, gather and assess the evidence. So uh, I'm going to just jump into our findings. I'm going to pull apart some of the quotes from the guidelines, and then I'm going to provide a little bit of analysis of my own, or of mine and Dale's, of course. So uh, the general principle states that in determining the procedure to be followed when considering the refugee claim of a child, the Refugee Protection Division should give primary consideration to the best interests of the child. It elaborates a little further by stating the phrase best interest of the child is a broad term and the interpretation to be, sorry, to be given to it uh, will depend on the circumstances of each case. There are many factors which may affect the best interest of the child, such as the age, gender, cultural background, and past experiences of the child. And this multitude of factors makes a precise definition of the best interests principle difficult. So in affirming the difficulty of creating a precise definition of the best interests principle, guideline three instead opts to leave this determination in the hands of adjudicators on a case by case basis. This is also the first instance where age, gender and cultural background are acknowledged, but they actually come about as a means of justifying ambiguity. Since factors like age, gender and cultural background are recognized uh, to impact the best interest of the child as indicated by this quote here, and research demonstrates that child claimants are met with suspicion based on these very same factors. A precise definition of the best interests principle is probably not entirely necessary. However, guideline three should provide context specific definitions of the best interests, or at least operating definitions of factors like age, gender, and cultural background, which don't actually exist within the documents. Otherwise, without elaborating on these types of special considerations, uh, uh, Guideline three would unwittingly homogenize uh, migrant and asylum seeking children and clump them together as just one entity. And the homogenization of children is actually clear in the way that they frame 
age-based supports. So I'm going to read off uh, two quotes that discuss the supports based on age. The first quote states, uh, this is section A, subsection 3, in determining what evidence the child is able to provide and the best way to elicit this evidence, the panel should consider, in addition to any other relevant factors, the following, the age and mental development of the child, both at the time of the hearing and at the time of the events about which they might have information, the capacity of the child to recall past events and the time that has elapsed since these events, and finally, the capacity of the child to communicate his or her experiences. The following section states that children are not able to present evidence with the same degree of precision as adults with respect to context, timing, importance, and details. They may be unable, for example, to provide evidence about the circumstances surrounding their past experiences or their fear of future persecution. In addition, children may manifest their fears differently from adults. So although there's a disaggregation of age between younger, or sorry, between adults and children, lacking from the documents are any distinctions between the needs of younger children and older children. The guideline three provisions are explicitly intended for all children under the age of 18, yet the language used to describe the children within these quotes and within the document overall appears to be targeted towards younger children. Of course, the consideration of age, mental development, capacity play a critical role in both assessing and or eliciting and assessing evidence. Yet it creates this ideal conception of childhood, one that reflects the need to protect the young, the incapable, and the vulnerable child. The language here illustrates the type of considerations uh, or the type of child that's deserving of special considerations, provisions, or protections. But the implications of the way Guideline 3 frames these instructions lead adjudicators to be able to scrutinize a child's demeanor and behavior in somewhat of an unstructured manner. So children have to provide a credible, non-contradictory narrative to adjudicators, but at the same time, if they appear too rehearsed, it also negatively impacts them. Even though there's no explicit disaggregation of age here, the implication is that the age of a claimant can specifically impact how an adjudicator both gathers evidence from them and assesses the evidence. Often younger, less mentally capable children acquire a free pass, whereas older children, or those even perceived as capable, are more likely to face heavy scrutinization. So whereas guideline three addresses age throughout the document, considerations based on the gender and cultural background of a child, we argue, are performative at best. I'm gonna read two more quotes, and this will be the last time I read quotes, so I'm not gonna bore everyone with the jargon, but. In determining the weight to be given to a child's testimony, the panel should consider the opportunity the child has for observation, the capacity of the child to observe accurately and to express what he or she has observed, and the ability of the child to remember the facts as observed. These factors may be influenced by the age, gender, and cultural background of the child, as well as other factors such as fear, memory difficulties, PTSD, and the child's perception of the process at the Refugee Protection Division. In the same section, it states, the child may, due to age, gender, cultural background, or other circumstances, be unable to present evidence concerning every fact in support of the claim. So far, our slides have shown you three out of the very five total instances where the terms gender and cultural background appear within the guidelines, the first being the best interests principle. These terms, gender and cultural background, always appear together and are linked to other factors like age and personal experiences. Unfortunately, without additional elaborations on what these terms actually entail, they, they serve as more platitudes or lip service as opposed to special considerations given to children. Uh, the next slide is going to show you the two last, the, this is the last slide with quotes, I promise. Uh, the two other instances where the terms gender and cultural background appear together in the document. So I've now shown you five out of five times where gender and cultural background are present. One instance is within the subsection on the designated representative, and the other uh, quote is within a footnote. So guideline three recommends that the designated representative and the interpreter of the child come from the same cultural and linguistic background, and that age, gender, and other personal characteristics should also be factors to consider. This is an important acknowledgement that permits the child to be able to build trust and communicate with individuals who should, in turn, uh, assist them throughout their claims process. However, 
the fact that one of the duties of the designated representative within the guidelines states that the designated representative is to provide evidence and be a witness in the claim suggests that the very protections granted to children on the basis of their cultural background or gender could also be used against them during the hearing. This is especially true given that whereas anything told to a lawyer is confidential and privileged, the same protections don't explicitly apply with a designated representative. And surprisingly, there's actually no mention whatsoever or acknowledgement of sexual orientation or gender identity within guideline three. This is particularly surprising considering the well-documented displacements of LGBTQ plus youth for fear of persecution in their home countries. The absence of sexual orientation and gender identity from these guidelines is actually significant. It speaks to the broader issue of dehumanization uh, throughout law and policy, especially regarding sexual minorities. So to wrap up with our discussion, the embedded objectification and dehumanization of refugee children isn't initially apparent, especially considering, as you've seen within the quotes, that there is an acknowledgement of factors like age, gender, or cultural background. However, the way in which these, uh, these quotes or the way in which the policy was framed, these children are discussed homogeneously without any actual distinctions based on the factors. And the homogenization of children in guideline three, as I've mentioned, creates this ideal notion of childhood where those who are deserving of protections are described as vulnerable, they're incapable of making decisions and entirely dependent on adults. This ideal notion isn't particularly a bad thing. However, what we noticed, and this is not just within uh, this guidelines, but a lot of research has shown that older children, unaccompanied children, and children without documentation challenge this very ideal notion. Uh, I think uh, Stephanie Silverman, the moderator, actually coined the term uh, imposter child, which is exactly what is the contradiction to this ideal notion of, sorry, not the contradiction, the opposite of this ideal notion of childhood, where they appear more adult-like, deceitful, and therefore their claims are less credible. The objectification of the ideal notion of childhood within the guidelines reflects not only institutional humanism, but also the discourses of disposability, where children who lack supporting documentation or even older children who are perceived as more capable are treated as adults in the eyes of the law and the very general principle of the best interests is taken away from them. It's no longer a primary consideration for them. They're viewed as disposable or even non-human and the detention and deportation becomes more reasonably justified. So I'm gonna pass it along to Dale for the concluding thoughts. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. Uh, Dale, you're muted. You, Dale. Sorry, here we go. Sam, put that slide back up because nobody can see our concluding points. I can discuss them anyway. So. You know, as Sam has pointed out in the discussion, there was lots of different perspectives that we've been taking through analyzing this document. Um, one of the reasons or the motivations for analyzing this document that many of you will probably already know this is that, you know, the guidelines was really reified and um, given a lot of attention as one of these cornerstones of great Canadian policy. Uh, and like Sam mentioned, you know, that's problematic. It's always problematic when people start to assume that a policy in place, just in the sense that it's been put in place and implemented in a particular way, it suggests that it's, it's doing the right thing, so to speak. So that was part of the motivation for us doing this research. And having gone through it and analyzing the language, I mean, we contemplated and played a lot with trying to decide if we should put in cases. And we ended up taking out the cases and making that a separate argument, partly because what we wanted to show here was the power of language and the power of documentation. Right? This is a, a trend that we see within discussions of criminology with you know dealing with risk and high risk. And as we've seen in the presentations in the last two days, also in the area of immigration, is that the documentation process is very important for understanding the outcomes of these sorts of cases. So what we had decided to do here was really focus on the language because with the ambiguity that we see within the guidelines, what we find is the ability to allow discretion to operate in various ways. And that's what we find problematic. We don't believe that discretion isn't necessary. We take up actually in the piece Anna Pratt's discussion of structured discretion and we approach it that way, but without the sort of 
um, understanding of these concepts and how to operationalize them, you're allowing people with very little experience and knowledge on a particular topic to make decisions and interpretations about these children. And that's the problem. And as we know, we've seen with immigration policies and practices in the past, there's always been a tendency to privilege particular types of children from particular types of countries. So in order to try to create a context where people who are administrating these processes or involved in administrating or deciding who gets to admit it, be administered by the guidelines, because if you're not considered a youth or a youth that's vulnerable, uh, you don't get the guideline provisions being applied to you. They actually have the right to remove those from you. So by looking at how this, how this um, document is put together and particularly how the specific the languages or lack thereof in this case, and acknowledging the, that there's things missing from this document that need to be addressed, we're illustrating where that space is coming from that might help us explain or be able to better guide uh, ways to move forward with how we deal with unaccompanied children. Uh, and I know that David would not agree with, you know, an alternative form of, uh, of um, incar not incarceration, uh, what's it called? <laughs> a placement for these students for these young people but even and I'm not we're not quite sure where we stand on that yet with within uh, what we found so far but just knowing in itself that having these sorts of documents being better described might lead to better outcomes whatever those outcomes might be anyway I could go on but I just want to thank everybody for sticking around and we'd be happy to field any questions Great, uh, thank you. Um, I realize we're uh, getting very late <laughs> um, in Europe. So I wonder um, if we could begin with any questions uh, for Raquel or Ionis, um, given the time. Uh, and 